The Princess and the Goblin Chapter 4 What the Nurse Thought of It Why, where have you been, Princess? asked the nurse, taking her in her arms. It's very unkind of you to hide away so long. I began to be afraid. Here she checked herself. What were you afraid of, Nursey? asked the Princess. Never mind, she answered. Perhaps I will tell you another day. Now tell me where you have been. I've been up a long way to see my very great huge old grandmother, said the princess. What do you mean by that? asked the nurse, who thought she was making fun. I mean that I've been a long way up and to see my great grandmother. Ah, nursey, you don't know what a beautiful mother of grandmothers I've got upstairs. She is such an old lady, with such lovely white hair, as white as my silver cup. I think her hair must be silver. What nonsense you are talking, princess, said the nurse. I'm not talking nonsense, returned Irene, rather offended. I will tell you all about her. She's much taller than you, and much prettier. Oh, I dare say, remarked the nurse. And she lives upon pigeons' eggs. Most likely, said the nurse. And she sits in an empty room, spin, spinning all day. Not a doubt of it, said the nurse. And she keeps her crown in her bedroom. Of course, quite the proper place to keep her crown in. She wears it in bed, I'll be bound. She didn't say that, and I don't think she does. That wouldn't be comfortable, would it? I don't think my papa wears his crown for a nightcap, does he, nursey? I never asked him. I dare say he does. And she's been there ever since I came here, ever so many years. Anybody could tell you that, said the nurse, who did not believe a word Irene was saying. Why didn't you tell me then? There was no necessity. You could make it all up for yourself. You don't believe me then, exclaimed the princess, astonished and angry, as well she might be. Did you expect me to believe you, princess? asked the nurse coldly. I know princesses are in the habit of telling make-believes, but you are the first I ever heard of who expected to have them believe, she added, seeing that the child was strangely in earnest. The princess burst into tears. Well, I must say, remarked the nurse, now thoroughly vexed with her for crying, it is not at all becoming of a princess and expect to be believed just because she is a princess. But it's quite true, I tell you, nursey. You've dreamt it then, child. No, I didn't dream it. I went upstairs and I lost myself, and if I hadn't found the beautiful lady, I should never have found myself. Oh, I dare say. Well, you just come up with me and see if I'm not telling the truth. Indeed, I have other work to do. It's your dinner time, and I won't have any more such nonsense. The princess wiped her eyes, and her face grew so hot that they were soon quite dry. She sat down to dinner, but ate next to nothing. Not to be believed does not at all agree with princesses, for a real princess cannot tell a lie. So all the afternoon she did not speak a word. Only when the nurse spoke to her, she answered her, for a real princess is never rude, even when she does well to be offended. Of course the nurse was not comfortable in her mind, not that she suspected the least truth in Irene's story, but that she loved her dearly and was vexed with herself for having been cross to her. She thought her crossness was the cause of the princess's unhappiness and had no idea that she was really and deeply hurt at not being believed. But as it became more and more plain during the evening in every motion and look that, although she tried to amuse herself with her toys, her heart was too vexed and troubled to enjoy them. Her nurse's discomfort grew and grew. When bedtime came, she undressed and laid her down, but the child, instead of holding her little mouth to be kissed, turned away from her and lay still. The nurse's heart gave way altogether, and she began to cry. At the sound of her first sob, the princess turned again and held her face to kiss her as usual, but the nurse had her handkerchief to her eyes and did not see the movement. Nursey, said the princess, why won't you believe me? 
because I can't believe you, said the nurse, getting angry again. Ah, uh, then you can't help it, said Irene, and I will not be vexed with you any more. I will give you a kiss and go to sleep. You little angel, cried the nurse, and caught her out of bed and walked about the room with her in her arms, kissing and hugging her. You will let me take you to see my dear old great big grandmother, won't you? said the princess, as she laid her down again. And you won't say I'm ugly any more, will you, princess? Nursey, I never said you were ugly. What can you mean? Well, if you didn't say it, you meant it. Indeed, I never did. You said I wasn't so pretty as that, as my beautiful grandmother. Yes, I did say that. And I say it again, for it's quite true. Then I do think you are unkind, said the nurse, and put her handkerchief to her eyes again. Nursey, dear, everybody can't be as beautiful as every other body, you know. You are very nice looking, but if you had been as beautiful as my grandmother... Bother your grandmother, said the nurse. Nurse, that's very rude. You are not fit to be spoken to till you can behave better. The princess turned away once more, and again the nurse was ashamed of herself. I'm afraid I beg your pardon, princess, she said, though still in an offended tone. But the princess let the tone pass, and heeded only the words. You won't say it again, I am sure, she answered, once more turning toward her nurse. I was only going to say that, if you had been twice as nice looking as you are, some king or other would have married you, and then what would have become of me? You are an angel, repeated the nurse again embracing her. Now, insisted Irene, you will come and see my grandmother, won't you? I will go with you anywhere you like, my cherub, she answered, and in two minutes the weary little princess was fast asleep. Chapter 5 The Princess Let's Well Alone when she woke the next morning, the first thing she heard was the rain still falling. Indeed, this day was so like the last, that it would have been difficult to tell where was the use of it. The first thing she thought of, however, was not the rain, but the lady in the tower, and the first question that occupied her thoughts was whether she should not ask the nurse to fulfill her promise this very morning and to go with her to find her grandmother as soon as she had had her breakfast. But she came to the conclusion that perhaps the lady would not be pleased if she took anyone to see her without first asking leave, especially as it was pretty evident, seeing she lived on pigeons' eggs and cooked them herself, that she did not want the household to know she was there. So the princess resolved to take the first opportunity of running up alone and asking whether she might bring her nurse. She believed the fact that she could not otherwise convince her she was telling the truth would have much weight with her grandmother. The princess and her nurse were their best of friends all dressing time, and the princess in consequence ate an enormous little breakfast. I wonder, Ludi, that was her pet name for her nurse, what pigeons' eggs taste like, she said as she was eating her egg not quite a common one, for they always picked out the pinky ones for her. We'll get you a pigeon's egg, and you shall judge for yourself, said the nurse. Oh, no, no, returned Irene, suddenly reflecting they might disturb the old lady in getting it, and that even if they did not, she would have one less in consequence. What a strange creature you are, said the nurse, first to want a thing, and then to refuse it. But she did not say it crossly, and the princess never minded any remarks that were not unfriendly. Well, you see, Ludi, there are reasons, she returned, and said no more, for she did not want to bring up the subject of their former strife, lest her nurse should offer to go before she had had her grandmother's permission to bring her. Of course she could refuse to take her, but then she would believe her less than ever. Now the nurse, as she said herself afterward, could not be every moment in the room, and as never before yesterday had the princess given her the smallest reason for anxiety, it had not yet come into her head 
to watch her more closely. So she soon gave her a chance, and the very first that offered, Irene was off and up the stairs again. This day's adventure, however, did not turn out like yesterday's, although it began like one. And indeed, today is very seldom like yesterday, if people would note the differences, even when it rains. The princess ran through passage after passage, and could not find the stair of the tower. My own suspicion is that she had not gone high enough, and was searching on the second instead of the third floor. When she turned to go back, she failed equally in her search after the stair. She was lost once more. Something made it even worse to bear it this time, and it was no wonder that she cried again. Suddenly it occurred to her that it was after having cried before that she had found her grandmother's stair. She got up at once, wiped her eyes, and started upon a fresh quest. This time, Although she did not find what she hoped, she found what was next best. She did not come on a stair that went up, but she came upon one that went down. It was evidently not the stair she had come up, yet it was a good deal better than none. So down she went and was singing merrily before she reached the bottom. There, to her surprise, she found herself in the kitchen. Although she was not allowed to go there alone, her nurse had often taken her, and she was a great favorite with the servants. So there was a general rush at her the moment she appeared, for everyone wanted to have her. And the report of where she was soon reached the nurse's ears. She came at once to fetch her, but she never suspected how she had got there, and the princess kept her own counsel. Her failure to find the old lady not only disappointed her, but made her very thoughtful. Sometimes she came almost to the nurse's opinion that she had dreamed all about her, but that fancy never lasted very long. She wondered much whether she should ever see her again, and thought it very sad not to have been able to find her when she particularly wanted her. She resolved to say nothing more to her nurse on the subject, seeing it was so little in her power to prove her words. End of chapter 5. Please go to the next clip for chapter 6.